fungus striatum grows, it's really important to focus on that peak at 14 and that decrease, which is normal maturational processes. But if you don't remember anything else from my talk, remember this. That's the growth and the development of the striatum in children with gene expansion. Most important to realize is that the study only goes back to age six. And already at age six, their striatum is enlarged. And then it continues to decrease over time. A completely different trajectory, completely different growth. And the pallidum had the same pattern as the striatum. But just published, we, we really looked very hard at all aspects of the cortex, thickness, um, surface area, regional. And there was no effect of mutant Huntington on the gross aspects of development of the cortex. This was very specific to the subcortical structures. Now remember, Ali, of course, there's a lot of action going very early on. But remember I said that even at age six, the striatum was already hypertrophied. When did that happen? It probably happened very early in life, right? So the time of the largest growth, the time period between birth and year one, the brain increases by 100% in volume. Uh, and so that, that time period is likely the time period that the gene is driving the development of the striatum. The other thing we saw is a CAG repeat effect. And in particular, above repeats of 50, the higher the CAG repeat, the higher the hypertrophy, and then the faster the decline, right? So everything in Huntington's is about the CAG repeat and about the spectrum. The higher the repeat, the higher the hypertrophy, and of course, the steeper the decline means that you're gonna have an earlier onset, right? So those children with the high CAG repeats are gonna motor manifest earlier in life. So what's happening here? What's, what's going on here? These are children that are 40 years from onset. Is that degeneration? Or is this some other kind of maturational process? Well, there's a couple ways to look at that. One thing is to remind you about normal brain development. So let's step back. This is normal brain development. These are not children from Huntington's families. And by the time you're six years of age, your brain is about 95% of normal right, of 95% of adult. But really what happens dramatically in that time is tissue remodeling. So this is what I call the slippery slope of adolescence. This is your cortex. This is what happens when you go through adolescence. And we're giving them the car keys right around there. It's like, hey, you're looking. This is normal development and it's programmed synaptic elimination. So it's gray matter pruning. It's not degeneration, it's not loss of neurons, it's loss of dendrites. And then concomitant to that, we have myelination. So during this time, between six and 20, even though your total brain is not changing, you have massive amounts of tissue remodeling that is happening that, that leads to changes in volume. So what might be the mechanism by which the enlarged striatum has a fast decline that's not degeneration? It could be the normal process of program synaptic elimination. Recent evidence has shown that this process is mediated by the complement system. So really important to think about this mechanism. And also recent studies have shown that abnormalities in this process in the late maturational phases of your brain can lead to neuropsychiatric symptomatology, and in particular for schizophrenia. So excessive pruning during these maturational phases is considered to be um, pathoetiologic for, for uh, schizophrenia. So is it possible that the normal pruning that happens in the GNE is excessive? and that it's not a degeneration, that it's just a loss of neurons, or I'm sorry, loss of dendrites? Possibility. Is there any other evidence that it's not just early degeneration? What can we look at to say, well, maybe those cells are actually degenerating? 
Well, we looked at NFL. So we partnered with Ed and Lauren, and we took our children, and we divvied them up into bins of years from onset, and we see that the NFL in the kids that are far from onset, right, 40 to 60 years, 30 to 40 years, 20 to 30 years from onset, there's no NFL. So even though their striatum is decreasing, they're not leaking NFL. Now, once you get close to onset, once you get within 20 years, and this group has shown that with the adults, it's 20 years to motor onset, you start leaking NFL, and it's a marker of degeneration, a very nonspecific one. So I was hoping to refer to Christina's talk. Hopefully she'll give it on the HDISS. So thinking about these stages, it's really important to think about that the early phases of um, what is called stage zero might actually be a developmental phase. But remember, even with the striatum changing during that time, there's not necessarily degeneration. The pre-symptomatic stage is one in which we know the striatum continues to change, and there is evidence of minor symptoms and of NFL increase, and then further on down. And of course, everything is modulated by the length of your CAG repeat, such that all of these phases are exactly the same no matter what your you know, disease is, it's just that it's shortened if your CAG repeat is longer. So how about brain function? Really important, because remember in development, sometimes bigger is not better, right? You can have autism and you can have an enlarged brain. So is that enlarged striatum, is that doing good or is it doing bad? So we looked at cognition, so a large, battery of tests, we divvy them up into domains, but then we make a composite, so I'll tell you, it's a composite score. Parent ratings, parents are really good at rating what kind of child their, their child is, right? So, but they will rate them on all sorts of behavior, and we looked at things like hyperactivity, aggression, depression, anxiety, opposition, and then motor skills. So we, do, we did not do Q-motor. I wasn't thinking, it probably wasn't available in 2009. Uh, but we had something called the PANES, which is actually a clinical exam that quantifies fine and gross motor. And so we divvied the children up into, these are observations far from onset. So those kids that were greater than 35 years from onset, midway to onset, 20 to 35 years, and then near onset. And granted, near onset, right, is still 20 years away. But this is the progression. This is my new tattoo. <laughs> I could hear Nacho. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm thinking about it. So this is the cognitive composite. Here's the GNE. And you can see here the children who are 35 years from onset are superior, statistically significantly superior in their thinking skills. What's more important is what you see happening when you continue to get closer to disease onset. So the children who are 20 to 34 years from onset, they're normal. They're completely the same as the gene non-expanded, but most importantly, they were probably superior earlier in life. And then as you get closer, then you get significantly different than you were before. So it's not only that the superiority early on, but early, early in the course of disease, we're seeing these changes. Same thing with depression and anxiety. So interestingly enough, it was the only thing that we saw different between the gene expanded and the gene non-expanded. The kids were protected. Those with gene expansion had less depression and anxiety as rated by their parents. Remember, their parents were completely blind as to their gene expansion. So this is related only to the gene. And then the other thing you can see too is by the time they get closer to onset, they're already starting to have some psychiatric symptomatology. Still not significantly different than their controls, but different than earlier in the course of the disease. And the same thing for motor function. 
So both in fine and, mo and gross motor skills, we see early superiority and then quick decline over time. So from disease onset, children are superior to the G&E group in cognitive scores, motor scores, and are protected from depression and anxiety symptoms. Cognitive and motor scores are significantly worsening over time, years before entering what would be considered the pre-symptomatic phase. So findings from this study support the notion that HTT may have been positively selected for human brain evolution. The primary pathology of the disease may be development of a striatal circuitry that is advantageous early in life, but vulnerable to later degeneration. Remember, evolutionary advantage is time limited. There's no need to live past the time of procreation. And of course, this is a Faustian bargain, right? Ability, liability. There's a lot of things that occur in human physiology and especially systems in the brain in which you have ability and liability. I could talk about sex differences, but that's a whole different talk. So just to let you know that the Kids HD study is now refunded into the Change HD study, and it's now become a multi-site study. So it's five sites, and we're essentially doing the study again. We're expanding the age range, and a big shout out to my friend and colleague, Aaron Furstimming, who is uh, in Houston. Uh, but we're really excited to continue with this story because the story that I just told you is the first time anyone's ever looked at it. And of course, no one study is definitive. We need to look further. Let's talk about long CAG repeats and juvenile onset. So as you know, the longer the repeats, the earlier the onset. And our sample was relatively enriched with repeats that were over 50. These were the kids HD, okay? They were not symptomatic. They just had a long CAG repeat and they came to see us when they were very young. But in addition to the kids HD, we also ran a study called the JOHD study, it ran in parallel. And these were children who were already diagnosed clinically already had genetic confirmation, and we followed them over time too. So briefly, the long CAG repeat and clinical features. So we, we use a term called AOHD, adult onset, so repeats that are 40 to 49, early onset HD. It's not a term that's used an awful lot, but to me, that's the forgotten middle piece that a lot of people don't talk about but it's repeats from 50 to 59, and it's onset usually between 21 and 39. And then of course there's juvenile onset, so typically repeats are over 60, and the onset is aged prior to 21. So it's the same triad of motor cognitive psychiatric, it's the same pattern of findings in which we frequently see psychiatric and cognitive symptomatology that predates sometimes for years the motor onset. The motor features in EOHD and JOHD are typically more hypokinetic than hyperkinesis, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. And there are some unique features of JOHD, especially for the childhood onset. So the question that we had is, you know, here we went up in the kids HD study to a CAG repeat of 60, right? And the question is, wow, how about repeats that are much higher than that? Maybe they were completely underdeveloped in stride, and maybe there was developmental aberration there, or maybe they were just starting out really, really high. So we went back to the Kids HD study, and we pulled out seven children who had a very long CAG repeat. It ranged from 51 to 73. So these were children who, at the time that we studied them, were not symptomatic. So you could consider them pre-EOHD or even pre-JHD, right, if you got a repeat longer than that. And we did, it once again, find striatal enlargement. There was not underdevelopment of the striatum, even in these children with exceedingly high repeats. And then we had one opportunity. We had a child that had previously been in our Kids HD study, eventually had been clinically diagnosed outside of our study by JOHD at the age of 12, and we were able to retrospectively look at her imaging. 
And actually, I'm going to show you a, this is dangerous, but <laughs> to get out of here and show you a video. Wait, wait. Okay, you ready? Okay. That's loud. Let's go. It's recording. Go, Autumn, go. Go, Autumn, go. Go, Autumn, go. Holy cow, look at her go. Woo! Good job. High five. All right. That's Autumn. And that's when she was age three. Oh, goodness. Yeah, let me. Every time I come in and out of it, I'm worried. But that's, that's the last time I'm going to jump out of it. Because it's really important for you to see her when she was three. I wouldn't, it's hard to say whether she was superior at that time, but you could see her development was quite impressive. And here's her imaging. Right? So we first saw her, the video of the monkey bars was when she was three. She came into our study when she was six, and then again at nine, and that's when she was diagnosed with JOHD. The blue dots are age sex matched um, controls. And this was her course. She started to have behavioral disturbance very early on, sleep disturbance, diagnosed with ADHD, vocal tick, hand movements, school performance decline, of course a clinical MRI scan that's normal, that's usually not helpful at all for diagnosis, and then finally, at the time of diagnosis, already having significant hypokinetic symptomatology. Good autumn. Tap, tap. Are you ready? One, two, three, four, four, three, two, one. Here she is, a lot of bradykinesia, <laughs> tries to use her other hand, because she can't even do that. All right, Autumn, go ahead and walk for me. Her walking is not bad, but you can see she has adventitious movements. All right, Autumn, now go ahead and walk one foot in front of the other for me. This is very difficult for her. She's 16 here. Good job. She's had a very right, rap Autumn, go ahead. rapid progression. So. A reminder that the entire course of the Huntington's disease is, might be pre-symptomatic, hypo, a hyperkinesis, but remember, especially in the late phases, there's hypokinesis, right? That's the same kind of trajectory for everybody. But if you just decrease that in the context of how short the course is for early onset, J-O-H-D, uh, adolescent onset and childhood onset. In JOHD, the hyperkinetic phase may be very hard to diagnose. Hyperactive versus normal is hard. The diagnosis typically occurs during the hypokinetic phase, and some of that is because they've just burned past everything else. The rate of decline is so fast that by the time you make it to diagnosis, they're already hypokinetic. Some people say it's a different disease. It's the same exact disease. We just don't diagnose it until they get to the hypokinetic phase. Okay. So uh, about the JOHD brain imaging study, just want to let you know. So we did uh, imaging scans on the kids with JOHD. And what you can see here is that many of the brain regions were not affected significantly, but what was significantly affected was their striatum and their pallidum. So it was really uniquely affected. And these were children who had been diagnosed relatively recently. The, re the regions were directly related to their symptomatology. And then importantly, even though they started very low, we could track progression very well. And we could see that actually we compared them to a group of adult onset Huntington's and we could see that the JOHD were changing much faster. And what that means is that they may be far more superior in a clinical trial. 
If you need to test whether a drug is effective, you don't want to wait two years for a change. If you have a JOHD subject, you might be able to affect, to see whether your drug is effective within one year. So they may be superior for clinical trials. A big thank you to all of the families and the children who participated in these studies and continue to participate in these studies. And thank you for listening and putting up with the poltergeist in my computer. Okay, we may have time for, podemos una pregunta solamente, vamos bastante retrasados. Gustavo, micrófono. I'll translate. Gustavo, you can, vas a preguntar en inglés? Okay. Okay, he's going to do it in English. Um, I, I just write a note in order to not to skip the important part of my question. So, uh, my, my main question, thank you for the lecture. It was one of my favorites so far. So, if the studies shows that it may be an enlarged stratum, stratum in the early phase of the disease. Is there any reason from the phenomenological standpoint that uh, you may see Parkinson's future if you, you have an enlarged stratum? And this, this, is, this is one of the main main feature of Parkinsonians, a uh, decrease in straighten. Yeah, so I didn't quite get, so tell me, ask me that again. So about the striatum. Yes, you, you see an, 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 an enlarge enlargement in the, in the early phase of the disease. Yes. But this is one of the main, what, this is one of the main feature of the, of Parkinson's disease patient that you, you see a dec decrease in stratum and you see yes. Parkinson's as a, 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 a clinical phenomenology, phenomenology. But you also say, uh, uh, you, you also say that uh, you see uh, hypokinesis of, or Parkinson's yes. in, the, in the early phase of the disease. It is, but not in the early stage. So in both, in everybody, early in the course of the disease, the striatal hypertrophy is associated with superior motor function, not with hypokinesis. Only when it gets very, very, very small, whether it's JOHD or whether it's adult onset, only when the striatum is small do they get motor symptoms. The striatal hypertrophy in the kids who were 40 years from onset, their motor skills were superior. They were not hypokinetic in any way. They were superior. Uh, I get it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bueno, estamos bastante retrasados, pero tenemos una charla más. Espero que se puedan quedar y luego vamos a comer. Uh, Michael. Ahora. Thank you, Peg. You, you need help doing that. Are you sure? Thank you so much. You, no, okay. Vamos a, com vamos a comer. Okay, we're going to lunch. <laughs> uh, there's going to be, in the lunch room, there's going to be a small informal presentation while you guys are eating. So we have about maybe 40, 45 minutes for lunch, okay? Gracias. Tranquilo, no pasa nada. <laughs>